Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Dr Olivia Remington. I'm a GP working in Melbourne uh, and I'm going to be talking to you all about low carb nutrition for type 1 diabetes. Uh, so just to start off with, with a few disclosures, um, I am a type 1 diabetic uh, who consumes a low carbohydrate diet to help manage my diabetes. Um, I'm a practicing GP and this has developed as a special interest of mine. So I use a low carb medicine approach uh, to help manage other patients with uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, as well as patients with a range of metabolic health problems. Um, this talk is basically outlining um, my experience of using a low carbohydrate diet uh, to manage my diabetes, uh, but doesn't constitute individual medical advice, just to keep that in mind. Um, and just to, as an overall um, warning, um, a low carbohydrate diet will usually require a reduction in insulin uh, to prevent hypoglycemia. So, you know, don't try this at home without making adjustments to your insulin uh, doses first. Okay, so I debated about whether or not I should include this photograph, but I thought um, it's relevant for a number of reasons. So uh, this photo was taken uh, around October of 1996. Uh, so we're back in the 90s, it was a simpler time then, uh, wearing an oversized Mambo t-shirt was clearly the height of fashion. Um, I had just finished a 10-day Great Victorian bike ride um, and this is what happens when everyone doesn't have a mobile phone. If your father doesn't meet you at the agreed meeting place, uh, you're stuck there waiting an hour and a half for him to finally decide to turn up uh, and that photo was uh, expressing my displeasure at, uh, <laughs> at having to wait around so long for him to finally turn up at the agreed meeting point. Um, this photo also represents, I guess, the beginning of the end of my normal life. Um, I did, got a chest infection um, as a result from spending a couple of days cycling in the rain. And after that chest infection had an onset of symptoms which I now know to be very typical for the classic presentation of type 1 diabetes. I became constantly thirsty, I was weeing all the time, I was losing weight, I got blurred vision, uh, I was tired um, and eventually my mum who was a former nurse realised something wasn't quite right, went to the GP, random blood sugar was I think 16 uh, and ended up that day being admitted to the local um, hospital in the paediatric ward learning how to inject insulin into oranges so not exactly how I envisaged spending my school holidays at the end of year 12. So this photo sort of ca it's, it's uh, the beginning of the end um, and it also encapsulates the way that I and probably many other type 1 diabetics have felt towards their diabetes um, over the years so I hope you you, you don't mind uh, me including that. Um, so I was diagnosed um, and was seen by a dietitian, seen by an endocrinologist, and I was given the standard dietary advice for type 1 diabetes, which is to consume a diet based in carbohydrate. I uh, was taught the subtle art of carb carbohydrate counting and was told um, that I needed to eat carbohydrates as the base of every meal, so approximately 30 grams of carbohydrates for breakfast, for lunch, around 45 grams of carbohydrate for dinner, plus a carbohydrate-based snack for morning tea, afternoon tea, and supper in the evening. And this was going to help keep my blood sugar levels nice and stable. All I needed to do was dose an appropriate amount of insulin for the amount of carbohydrates that I'm eating, and, uh, and all will be well. Uh, for interest's sake, I thought you might like to see what 45 grams of carbohydrate looks like. So this um, ramekin, small ramekin of pasta, and this is actually a, a vegetable pasta bake recipe from Diabetes Australia. So that is an adult's dinner. That, that uh, ramekin of pasta is 45 grams of carbohydrate. And I'm sure you would all agree that that looks like an extremely filling dinner and there is no way that you would be hungry or want to eat any more than 45 grams of carbohydrate if you're sitting down to eat that. Um, I was also taught to ha how to manage um, my hypo. So when your blood sugar level goes too low, um, you want to use 15 grams of a short acting carbohydrate. So the, the jelly beans, barley sugar, um, wait 15 minutes, repeat if the blood sugar is still low. Um, and it's very important that you needed to follow that up with 15 grams of a longer acting carbohydrate if it was going to be some time before you ate, ate again to make sure that your blood sugar levels stayed nice and stable. Now, 
no one ever mentioned that at the time, but actually one gram of carbohydrate will increase your blood sugar by about 0.3 millimoles. Uh, so if you're using that 30 grams of carbohydrate in total, that's actually going to increase your blood sugar by about nine, which means if your blood sugar is 3.5, just by treating that hypo, uh, you're gonna be going up to somewhere around you know, 12, 13 thus being on that continual roller coaster of blood sugars, which I found that I was on for, for such a long time. So how does the current approach that type one diabetics are taught, how does this um, uh, you know, play out in the long term in the way that we manage our diabetes? Well, not terribly well. If you look at a study that was done looking at the glycemic outcomes of, um, of adolescents with diabetes, um, and they followed up over 3,000 participants who had diabetes for nearly six years, they found that 73% of children and adolescents are not meeting the recommended target HbA1c of 7.1%. Um, and I would certainly count myself on that number. My HbA1c was routinely around 7, 8, 9. I really struggle despite doing my absolute best with carbohydrate counting and trying to match my insulin that I just could never achieve a HbA1c you know better than that expected target um, and the average HbA1c in that study was 8.3 percent so I take some comfort that I'm not alone in that. Um, the other interesting things that came out of that study is that 33% of the participants were overweight or obese um, and you know nearly half of them were on um, insulin pumps so you know this is um, widely thought to be you know the best way of managing type 1 diabetes now um, so even with using an insulin pump you know still not getting people to the the recommended targets and no one really likes to dwell on this and it's a bit depressing but I think it needs to be said that the outcomes for adults with type 1 diabetes are not great, okay. Um, overall our life expectancy is 12 years less than the general population. The death rates for type 1 diabetics are twice as high than the general population and the death rates are 4.5 times as high for type 1 diabetics under the age of 45 years, if we're comparing that to the general population. I've just turned 40 and I find that mildly terrifying, very terrifying. Um, so again, I'm not wanting to dwell on this, but I'm just trying to sort of just show what the situation is. Um, you know, if we look at the outcomes for type 1 diabetes and the top five causes of, of death for people with top, type 1 diabetes, um, you're looking at the actual diabetes itself, followed by heart disease, um, cerebrovascular disease, so that's things like stroke. Um, and interestingly, and I found this to be, you know, quite confronting that suicide is the fourth most common cause. It was just a, above kidney failure. Um, and I think this is again something that's perhaps not talked about very much, but just that chronic mental burden of trying and failing and struggling with a disease that sometimes can just feel so unmanageable despite you know, your best efforts and everything that you're trying to do and trying to follow the advice. Um, and, and certainly for me, just this constant feeling of failure in the way that I was just not able to manage my diabetes. Um, you know, for some people that really can become quite overwhelming and I think you do get to a sort of a point where, you know, I felt like I was doing everything that I, I could be doing. Um, this was just what it was going to be, you know, this, this was just life as a type 1 diabetic. Um, and the reason why um, a poorly controlled diabetic is at risk of all of these things is because the high glucose is toxic to cells. Um, so it can cause um, an increase in free radicals, um, so or reactive oxygen species. Um, so these cause inflammation and damage to the DNA and it will cause cellular damage to pretty much every cell in the body. So your coronary and renal arteries, the brain cells, your nerve and tendon cells that don't have any defence mechanism against these high glucose levels um, and also your retinal cells, so the cells in the back of your eyes.
is there a way we can improve this? Well, yes, we, we are constantly being told that if we can control our blood sugar levels through intensive carbohydrate counting and insulin management, um, that you can improve your diabetes control. And this is what they showed with the DCCT trial, which followed up uh, type one diabetics for over 10 years. And they found that in the intensive arm, where they were treated with intensive insulin, carbohydrate um, counting, uh, that they did actually get their HbA1c down to um, that 7.1%, okay, um, which was fantastic. They had less complications, um, they had increased life expectancy, so that was fantastic. The problem was that came at an increased risk of hypoglycemia because if you're giving more insulin, then there is more risk of dropping the blood sugar level too low after eating. Um, so there was, you know, it was thought to be great, but you know, obviously you want to use it in caution in people who are having multiple hypos or were unaware of their low blood sugar. Um, and also they noticed there was a five kilogram weight gain in the people on the intensive treatment arm. So you sort of you know, left with, well, why is this, in, you know, why is this so difficult? It, it all seems like it should be so easy. I've, I've written a list here and, you know, there are many other things that you could put on here, but it's very easy to um, over or underestimate the amount of carbohydrates that you're having particularly when eating out. Um, food labels can be out by a factor of 20%. Um, Australian food packaging lists net carbs, not total carbs. Um, so it's assumed that the, the fibre part of the carbs does not raise your blood sugar level. So they take that out of the carbohydrate count. Um, but for some type 1 diabetics, that fibre content can trigger distension, which can raise other hormones that can still cause an increase in your blood sugar level. So if you're not accounting for that, you can be consistently too high. Um, your insulin absorption can vary from injection to injection, particularly if you're injecting large amounts of insulin. Um, anything over seven units being injected at a time, that it will affect how, how well that insulin is absorbed. Um, and then there's all of these other things. It'll depend on your weight for women, your hormones, what time of the cycle it is, the exercise that you're doing, how long you've had diabetes, the weather, um, you know, there's no end to the other variables that can affect your blood sugar levels. Um, and then particularly if you've had poorly controlled type 1 diabetes for a long time, uh, like myself, you can then actually develop insulin resistance to all of that insulin that you're injecting. Um, and in the 20 plus years from my diagnosis, I steadily gained over 30 kilos in that time. So my insulin requirements varied significantly. So you feel like you're sort of in the ultimate catch 22. So you wanna be a good diabetic with tight control, but that can cause more hypos and weight gain, and that's bad. Uh, versus you don't wanna be a bad diabetic because that's poor control and poor outcomes, so that's bad. So what, what do you do? Um, at around the end of 2016, uh, a couple of things happened. Um, one is that for the first time ever, I was uh, diagnosed with some mild background retinopathy on my routine diabetic eye screening. Um, and that was a pretty big wake up call for me because um, as a doctor, I know that if I have um, changes occurring to the small vessels in the back of my eyes, that there would be likely be damage occurring to other parts of my body. Um, the other thing that happened, and it probably ended up being the best thing to ever happen to me as a diabetic, was that my husband was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. <laughs> and what that meant is that he didn't have that sort of nearly 20 years of ingrained knowledge and dogma and medical training. He did what anyone does these days and goes out and Googles diabetes and treatment options and went on to forums and groups and discovered low carb and said, well, you know, have you heard about using this kind of low carb, high fat diet to manage diabetes? And my initial response was, well, that's crazy. You know, who's, who's gonna do that? Eating all that fat will kill me and I need carbohydrates. Um, but I then actually started doing my own research into it um, and realised that actually what he was talking about makes a huge amount of sense. Um, and there's actually a um, doctor by the name of Richard Bernstein. Um, he's an American doctor. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as a teenager, followed the conventional dietary advice, carb counting, insulin, and was developing significant complications by the time he was in his 30s. He was 
was an engineer who actually went to medical school, trained as an endocrinologist so that he could learn everything he needed to know about how to manage his diabetes. And what he came up with was the law of small numbers. Um, which is basically boils down to that if you eat a small amount of carbohydrates and take a small amount of insulin, that is going to lead to predictable results and essentially normal blood sugars. And his belief is that all type 1 diabetics are entitled to the same normal non-diabetic blood sugars as anybody else, um, which is quite, you know, uh, that was quite eye-opening for me because it was just not something I ever thought was possible. So if you take that approach, it is actually possible to be a normal diabetic following a low carbohydrate diet, having less insulin and achieving normal blood sugars. So everyone's different, every type 1 diabetic is different in terms of what's a low carbohydrate to them. Um, it was certainly something that I came to very gradually. Um, I loved my carbohydrates and I was in no hurry to give them up. But certainly in terms of if you're looking at the evidence, studies show that there is a significant benefit of reducing your carbohydrate intake even to less than 100 grams a day. Um, it can help improve your blood sugars and reduce the risk of hypos. Um, so if you're looking at using a very low carb or ketogenic approach that's generally thought to be less than 30 grams of carbs per day having a moderate amount of protein and healthy fats um, and that will result in needing less insulin more predictable blood sugars so Bernstein's personal approach is to try and keep your breakfast carbohydrates to 6 grams and then 12 grams of carbohydrates for lunch and dinner um, and aiming to keep the protein content of the meals um, constant um, and then instead of using the, the normal guidelines for managing a hypo, using pure glucose, which is going to be absorbed directly into the circulation, doesn't need to be metabolised by the liver, which fructose does. Um, and, you know, working on this idea that one gram of glucose is going to raise your blood sugar by about 0.3. So using maybe three to four grams of glucose to treat a hypo initially and then repeating as needed to help bring you back up to a normal level, but without that rebound hypoglycemia. So is there any evidence to help support this approach? And there are actually um, emerging studies coming out showing that yes, actually this, this does work. Um, and in particular, there was a 2018 online survey of a um, type one diabetes uh, Facebook group called Type One Grit. Um, and the participants in that um, survey all follow Dr. Bernstein's approach. Um, and their average HbA1c was 5.67%, which is really quite amazing if you think about you know, that other study that I showed before that looking at the outcomes where the average HbA1c was 8.1%. Um, so it is possible and it does work. Um, and in fact, Diabetes Australia does now actually recognise in their position statement um, that a low carbohydrate diet you know, can be an approach that can be used by people with type 1 diabetes. So I'd done my reading, done my research, felt that okay, I was ready to, to break up with carbs. Um, so there's nothing like a bit of self-experimentation. Um, so this is going back through my own data. Uh, and this is just looking at what my blood sugar levels looked like uh, when I was following the standard diabetic diet. So as you can see, um, the idea is you want them to mostly be in the green. Um, they're pretty much anything but mainly in the green. Um, that was my insulin requirement, so that varied quite a lot depending on how much carbohydrate I was having, um, but we would routinely be having over 40 to 50 units a day, sometimes over 100 units if I was having a really um, heavy carbohydrate day. Um, and that's just looking at the, the daily carbohydrate intake, so I think based on that it was coming in at around 50 to 60 grams a day. I'd sort of, when these were taken, I'd just sort of start, slowly started reducing my amount of carbohydrates. So if we compare that now to what my blood sugars now look like. So I now follow a low carb ketogenic diet. Um, I will eat less than 30 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, and you can see from that gray area that most of my blood sugars are actually within range. Um, my estimated HbA1c from my um, continuous glucose monitor was 5.9%. I think it actually came in at 5.8%. Um, minimal sort of time in 
um, hypoglycemia and then coming back up to, to normal without these massive rebound highs. Um, and I can't overestimate or the, the overemphasize how amazing this feels to have been on that roller coaster of high blood sugars up and down for nearly 20 years, to have just days and days and days of where my blood sugar is essentially normal. I can think clearly, I can see patients without worrying that my blood sugar is gonna to go too low or I need to go off and have something to eat or have the carbs. Um, it's, it has just been completely life-changing for me. So if we have a look here, I'm not one for keeping my records. I generally found them too depressing to hang on to, but I have managed to dredge up some old HbA1Cs. So you can see that, you know, the, the uh, and I'm sure I have some that were much worse than this, but you know, usually they were around that seven to eight percent. And you can see over the last couple of years that that gradual decline down um, to the point where my last HbA1C was 5.8 percent. That's not a number I ever thought I would ever see. Um, so I'm incredibly proud of that. Um, and also more significantly, um, just looking back through my old um, retinal screening report, so you know, going back as far as 2013, everything was fine. Um, by 2015, um, I had those microvascular changes. Um, that was consistent through 2016 and 2017, and I had my screening, annual screening um, review earlier this year. And there was no retinopathy. And I actually asked him, I asked the ophthalmologist to double check and triple check the images. And he was number one amazed by my HbA1c because there is just this expectation that you're a type 1 diabetic for over 20 years. So, um, you know, I was amazed at how low my HbA1c was and also at, at just how healthy um, the back of my eyes looked. Some other nice things that happened um, was that since reducing my intake of carbohydrates and being able to reduce my um, amount of insulin that I'm injecting, um, I've actually lost and kept off um, 20 kilos. So that's been nice as well. So question I get asked a lot, but what do you eat? Um, so I've just sort of put together some, um, some pictures of what some typical foods for me might be. And I guess if you want to compare back to that little ramekin of pasta, which was 45 grams of carbohydrate, um, these are all meals that would be less than 12 grams of carbohydrate. You know, I have low carb waffles. Um, you know, if I'm eating out, that picture in the centre there is, you know, I have steak and veggies. There's a low carb cheesecake there. Um, that tower of cheese was the cake of cheese that I had for my 40th birthday, which was a huge hit. I thought I'd be eating leftover cheese for days, but it just got demolished. Um, so, you know, I'm, I do not feel deprived. I enjoy everything that I eat um, and I enjoy even more the fact that I can eat those foods. Um, they're filling, they're delicious and they leave me with normal blood sugars. So just a few practical points. Um, as I said at the start, um, you need to reduce your insulin if you are going to be having less carbohydrates and that may be by up to 50%. You cannot do this being on a fixed dose of insulin. You're going to need to make adjustments. Um, you may also need to look at um, basal insulin requirements. Um, another big learning point for me was that protein was not free, which I had always been taught that it was, that you didn't need, you know, protein doesn't raise your blood sugar, you don't need to give insulin for for it, it's free. Well, when you're on a very low carbohydrate diet, your liver can actually use the amino acids from the protein through this process called gluconeogenesis, which I vaguely remember learning about as a medical student. And it basically means that your liver can make glucose for you, which is fantastic if you're on a low carbohydrate diet. You don't need to get glucose from your food. Your liver will very happily make it for you. Um, so I do need to inject for that. So I use a slower acting insulin called Act Rapid because protein causes a slow or more gradual rise in your blood sugar level um, and it works beautifully. For people who are on a pump, they need to look at doing a dual wave or an extended bolus so they're getting that insulin over a longer period of time. If you do it as a, as a normal carbohydrate with um, short acting insulin, um, you can hypo afterwards because the, the protein just has a much longer, um, it takes a lot longer for it to increase the blood sugar level. So continuous glucose monitoring has been fantastic for me. Um, it makes it a lot easier to um, 
to just know what's going on, but I'm also aware that it's very expensive and if you are not eligible for CGM monitoring through the NDSS, a lot of people just cannot afford this. So you will be needing to test more frequently, particularly in the initial stages. Um, if you don't know what's going on, it's harder to fix it. Um, and it's also helpful, um, particularly if you're using the CGM, to detect asymptomatic hypoglycemia. Um, the other thing that I get asked about a lot, um, and there's a lot of concern about whenever anyone hears the word ketosis, their mind immediately goes to diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, the two are completely different. Um, so nutritional ketosis is a benign, normal metabolic state um, where our body uses fatty acids from the fat that we eat or from ketone bodies that are made from our own fat um, instead of glucose as a primary energy source. Um, our bodies have always been able to do this and it allows our metabolism flexibility to deal with periods of um, famine or major shifts in the dietary fuels that are available. Um, and that will normally result in a ketone level of between 0.3 to 3. Okay. If you compare that to DKA, um, that is an unstable and dangerous condition and it's due to insulin deficiency or insufficient um, ex you know, exogenous insulin um, in, so for example, in someone with type 1 diabetes who becomes ill, their blood sugars go up high, they're not matching that with enough insulin, then those ketones can build up very quickly um, and you know, go up to 15 to 25 and result in ketoacidosis. Um, and that will normally be accompanied by symptoms, um, nausea, vomiting, thirst, um, abdominal pain and, and high blood sugar levels. So the two are not the same. I'm in nutritional ketosis, I'm not in diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, another thing to be aware of is that if you do adopt a low carbohydrate diet, you do seem to develop some degree of intolerance to having large amounts of carbohydrates. Um, and it's thought that this is because of the changes in that metabolic machinery, it's, it's hard to sw constantly be switching between the two. And it's thought that that may be related to uh, peripheral insulin resistance to help protect against hypoglycemia. So, you know, and, and I guess it makes sense if you think about it, if your body's used to you having, you know, less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day, and then all of a sudden you go out and eat a piece of cake and have 60 grams of carbohydrate, you know, if you were then to inject an, a huge amount of insulin or someone who doesn't have diabetes, their pancreas to make a huge amount of insulin, you don't want to, over, to overshoot too much and cause, you know, life-threatening low blood sugar. Um, so, you know, it is something that I've had to accept that, you know, I'm just low carb, I don't have cheat days, I don't just have, you know, um, a, a big blowout every now and then because it does result in very high blood sugars that can take a long time, longer than I would expect um, to get down to normal. But I'm happy with that. So, um, a few kind of final thoughts. Um, if we look back at the current dietary guidelines um, that it, a type 1 diabetic is given when they are diagnosed, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that that's associated with pretty poor outcomes. For me, and I think the most amazing thing about low carb is that it offered me hope that there was another way to manage my diabetes, um, to help improve my control and to, you know, maybe help prevent me dying from 12 years earlier than my peers because I want those 12 years. So I firmly believe that all type one diabetics need to know that low carb is an option. It's safe, it's effective, you don't have to do it, everyone's different, but it's an approach that works and I think all type ones um, deserve to know that this is available to them. And. Uh, if you would like to do some further reading, I've just listed some resources that I found very helpful. So um, Richard Bernstein's book, The Diabetes Solution, um, it's got pretty much everything you could ever want to know about how to manage type 1 diabetes. Um, Bright Spots and Landmines by Adam Brown um, is another really helpful, more user-friendly book. Um, he follows a low carbohydrate approach. Uh, there are Facebook groups that offer support. Um, Diabetes.co.uk has a low carbohydrate program for type 1 diabetics. Um, and there are some also some really great talks on the low carb down under YouTube channel, um, particularly by Jake Kushner, who's a pediatric 
pediatric endocrinologist in America who uses and recommends a low carbohydrate diet to his type 1 diabetic patients um, and Troy Stapleton who is a radiologist working up in Queensland who discovered this way earlier than me really embarrassingly I think it only took him a few months from his diagnosis to work out that low carb was the way to go it took me nearly 20 years but better late than never um, and I, so I have a Facebook page. Um, I'm starting to see more and more type ones who are wanting, you know, to, to explore this further. Um, and I'm also available via email as well. Um, so thank you very much for listening.